So in this section, I want to talk about some of the developments in the last 20 years around the issues of uh, race, biology, anthropology, because in some ways, the science on this got very, got established from pretty early on. And then there were some, uh, there, there, there's been some, I guess I would say advances or challenges to it. Um, I start off with this, uh, the earth goes around the sun. So every day we wake up pretty early for this class and we watch, you know, pretty soon we'll be able to watch, we watch the sun rise and we see the sun go around the earth. And the only reason we believe that the earth actually goes around the sun is because science tells us, right? We learn it in school. All of our senses tell us that the sun is going around the earth. It's only because of science that we learn that the earth goes around the sun. And race kind of works the same way. All of our senses tell us, because our society is organized the way it is, that it's a biological thing. But the science is pretty clear that it's not, but it takes it takes us some training to figure out that it contradicts sometimes the evidence of our senses. So again, this should have been apparent back, or this was apparent back at the time of what we call the modern evolutionary synthesis. Because on the one hand, you had Mendel revealing that individual traits didn't come as a package and combine and recombine in different ways, including physical and biological traits. And from Darwin, the idea that species don't have these fixed essences. And if species don't have fixed essences, we certainly shouldn't expect that subspecies should have fixed essences or essentialism. And so again, the science on this was pretty well established from early on. The anthropologist Frank Livingstone declared in 1964 that there, there are no races, there are only clines. And what he meant by that is there's not these big groups that we call races, but there are geographical variations and clines or gradual variation along along gradients that you, you can chart out and describe according to, uh, you can uh, chart biological difference. And then a very famous article by Richard Lewinton, who was one of the first to uh, grind up the DNA and sort out the genetic evidence. And it's a 1972 article, there you go, 50 years ago, called The Apportionment of Human Diversity. And basically what he did is discover that, that there is more genetic diversity within any so-called group than there is between any so-called group. And that applies to a whole bunch of other traits as well, like height and um, different physical characteristics. Uh, whenever you try to map out one of these groups, you're going to find there's a wider range of diversity within them than there is between the groups, which calls into question our grouping. So at least by the time of the 1970s, anthropologists and others got fond of saying that race is not a biological uh, category, it's a social construct or a cultural construct. So we would say, Race is a social construct. It's something we do in society or in culture, but it doesn't correspond to a biological type of human species. Since 2001, about 20 years ago, the idea that race is a social construct has been challenged in some ways, or people have, have said, no, wait a second. Is it really a social construct? Now, I think there's a number, of, there's a few sources for why it's been challenged. One is our friends, our buddies, the forensic anthropologists who go on TV and all of a sudden rush out with a bone and say, aha, go get him. It's a white man, go get him. 
or, you know, <laughs> they seem to be able to, to identify race really well from bones. So there's that. And then there's those ancestry companies where you can swab up your spit and send it off and they'll tell you you're this percent this and that percent that. But there's also, I think, I want to be clear, there's, an, uh, there's also been a misunderstanding of the idea of a social construct. So when we say something is socially constructed, a lot of people think that that just means, ah, it's all made up. It's just imaginary. And so I want to be clear. When we in the sciences and the social sciences say something is a social construct, and we'll talk about this in terms of, say, gender being a social construct, it doesn't mean that there isn't any biological variation. It doesn't mean that people don't vary or there, there isn't genetic diversity. It doesn't, we weren't saying there weren't any clines. When Livingstone said there are no races, there are only clines, there were still clines. There was still biological variation. We're just saying that the way that we categorize it is socially different from society to society and in different ages, and that's important. And so if we say race is a social construction, bless you, that means it's actually a very real thing. It's something that has an influence. Let me give you an example. Money is a total social construction. The only reason that we think these pieces of paper are little electronic bits that we can do something with them and buy candy bars with them is because we believe it. It doesn't have, it's just a piece of paper. Heck, when you Venmo somebody something for, to get some food, it's just because they believe they have a number in their account. It's a total social construct. But boy, oh boy, it helps to have it around when you need it. When you need to buy a candy bar, it really helps to have that social construct of money in your pocket or on your phone. And so this leads to, something that is important and people have realized in recent years is that our social constructions, the way in which we make up the world in our society has very real and biological consequences. If I don't have enough money to buy food and that's gonna have some biological consequences even though it's just a total social agreement that, uh, that money matters. So I want to go through these, though, the forensic anthropology bit and the ancestry bit, because those are kind of relatively new things, at least in terms of what we see on television. The forensic anthropologist Sauer, Norman Sauer, asked, had a great article in 1992, which was called, If Races Don't Exist, Why Are Forensic Anthropologists So Good at Identifying? And I don't know, the forensic osteology class is very popular here at Hartwick. And I know Professor Anderson is good at talking about these issues, but it can be a little bit confusing sometimes because why is it that, the, that we can hold up some bones and pronounce something about what race that person is or was? So I wanna talk about what the forensic anthropologists are doing. What the measurements are when we talk about bones and, and the remains, the skeletal remains, is they give us an estimate of what we think they're the people, where they would have come from, a probable ancestry estimate. And in order to then get from there to what we imagine the racial classification would be depends upon the context in which the remains were found. So there was a really interesting article uh, by Konig, Konigsberg and colleagues back in 2009, where they took the bones of a person who had been found in a creek in Iowa, and they decided to to subject them to this forensic analysis. So, and to just show us how this process works. And what they said is when they did the measurements of the bones and then put them into a world database, 
of like where this person probably was from, the thing that most popped up was an Easter Islander. Now, the problem with that though is how many Easter Islanders live in Iowa? Very few, none Easter Islanders, probably, maybe a couple here and there. And so they said, well, actually, if we run it again, but we use the makeup of the people who live in Iowa, then we would have to say that this person falls, the bones fall within someone who would probably identify as white, which is not a huge surprise if you've been to Iowa. Now, they then said, but what if we had found these same remains in Gary, Indiana? which is of a different composition than Iowa. If you've ever been to Gary, Indiana, they said, well, if we had found these very same bones and measured them in the probabilities structure of Gary, Indiana, we would say that this person was black, which again, if you've been to Gary, Indiana, you probably know that there's some high percentage chance. And then they said, well, what if we'd found these bones in Hawaii? And they say, well, then we would probably say that it was a native Pacific Islander, which makes sense because the first idea or the against a world database was Easter Islander. So what does this mean? Well, one thing that means is that you can't just take up a bone and tell you me what the skin color was. There's no, there's no, it doesn't translate that far. It doesn't go that far, nor can you get sort of your typical things that we've used to sort out race. So what the forensic anthropologists do, and I guess this doesn't translate very well into television, is, is you're trying to estimate probable ancestry you're then matching that against the people that are in that population where the remains are, and you're giving us an estimate for what then you think the racial classification would be based on the social classification scheme of the time. So it's actually when, when we say, aha, we have the remains of a white man, which is what it was in Iowa, they knew that already, but it, you're, you're doing this kind of a shorthand uh, of what you can actually. Uh, analyze from the bones. Now, what about those ancestry companies? Well, Ariana, what do the ancestry companies want from you? Money, yeah. I mean, you know, it's big business, right? You send in your swab and you get, you give them your money and they give you your some percentages which look very accurate, right? It looks like you have a nice percentage there. One of the issues with the ancestry stuff, in addition to the money part, is that you know they have a limited sample of the human genetic diversity. And so most of the people that have sent their swabs in are from the people who can give them the money and so that's where their database is being built up. So that's one issue with the ancestry stuff. The other issue is that if you do the math, each of us has so many ancestors or potential ancestors. So if you go back one generation, you have two, right? Your parents, two generations, four, Three generations, eight, and it keeps going exponentially, 16, 32. You go back about 500 years or somewhere between 500 to 1,000 years ago, which doesn't sound very long ago when it talk about race, then you have, you can do your every 30 year math and 
do two to the 64 or whatever it is, you have like a million ancestors as of a thousand years ago. So, you know, it turns out that all of us are kind of mixed up in weird ways and we all have all these potential ancestors. The other thing is, is that a lot of people in this country, a lot of people in the United States are sometimes doing these things and then trying to claim that they are, they are of uh, Native American ancestry. All of a sudden they've discovered some Native American genes or something. And uh, uh, this is actually something that uh, Dr. Kim Tallbear, who has worked with uh, some of these ancestry companies and is, uh, you know, is a, an indigenous uh, American has said that I, I found uh, very compelling. She doesn't say this, I got this quote from her, uh, from uh, a, another, another venue that she described. She said, it's not just a matter of what you claim, but it's a matter of who claims you. And so I think what she was saying is, just because you may have some genetic ancestry of a certain, uh, you know, uh, and try to say that there's Native American or indigenous ancestry doesn't mean you are actually that. In fact, it has to do with a social identification or who, who what group you have been a part of and, and who claims you as well. Um, so uh, her analysis is in uh, Mucklebin's awesome camp. They mentioned uh, how she's very suspicious of the, the attempts to to uh, promote tribal identification from the genetic stuff. I do think sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to figure out that some people send their swabs off and we discover that, oh, wait a second, I'm not actually as, uh, we're, we're, uh, there's, there's a lot more mixing going on than, than I thought and I'm not as, French or Italian or Irish as I thought I was. Uh, most people are combinations of things and we have all been mixed and remixed over time. So uh, sometimes, I don't, I don't know, I'm not gonna say it's necessarily bad, you just have to be, be careful with it. Now, like I said, the other things that, that I wanna talk about are our developing understanding of race and biology. Now we know that humans do vary biologically and that those biological variations can have effects on our health. We talked about lactose tolerance, malaria resistance, and it can also affect abilities, athletic abilities, or even things like what we call intelligence. And so uh, one of our anthropological colleagues over at SUNY Oneonta, I think I quoted him before on the mostly out of Africa point, said, and it's a good shorthand, I think, for what race is, is that race is a culturally constructed label. So we, we do have it as a social construction, but it does, that crudely and imprecisely describes real variation. So he's trying to preserve that idea that there is real variation and that our ideas of race only crudely and imprecisely describe. But what I wanna emphasize here that again, when we socially or culturally construct a label and we put people into boxes, it can actually influence their access to education, their access to healthcare, their access to wealth, their opportunities and their outcomes. And that those labels and those social constructions and those laws that we have put into place often have much greater health effects than ancestry and certainly have a much greater effect on abilities than, uh, than simply our biological or genetic variation. And so this is where uh, many anthropologists have started to, many biological and medical anthropologists have begun to talk to us about the biological consequences of racism. So as we've seen, 
these social constructs, our ideas and classifications about where we're going to put people in the world have biological implications. It's not just at the level of ideas or people calling each other names. It has implications for where we grow up and who we and the kind of education we'll receive. And so those people who are who live in conditions of political marginalization or in conditions of poverty, especially as the child is developing, as, as our, our bodies are developing, um, and we know that the human organism is very plastic, it's very adaptable to different environments, uh, tend to, these things can have can have deleterious or, or harmful effects, and so there's a researcher that has done a lot of work on this, uh, Clarence Gravely, who talks about how race becomes biology through the embodiment of social inequality. So it's not that race is uh, is a biological reality in terms of the genetics. But if people are put into these categories and discriminated against, or then it can have a biological effect. And so he draws this as a kind of feedback loop in which you have race, and especially what we call institutional or systemic racism, becoming biological. So if your, your adult health, if you are uh, influenced by things like stress, hypertension, diabetes, stroke, these kinds of things, it can lead to uh, poor maternal outcomes, which then lead to poor maternal, uh, you know, fetal health outcomes and infant health outcomes. Um, and so it results in this kind of feedback loop. Now, this can be rather depressing and uh but and so i want to emphasize that this doesn't mean it has to continue in this cycle forever this is not this does not become sort of genetically fixed uh it's it's not it's not necessarily for uh i mean it, it doesn't have to persist but it can be very persistent if we don't uh do some kind of intervention but i do want to say that our social constructs and our ideas about the world, about things like race and racism can be remade, but it takes knowledge about what's going on, it takes understanding that this has been the structure that we've created, and it takes resources, it takes investment in order to change the outcomes of education and healthcare and, uh, and the, the outcomes of differential access to resources that people have had over time. So I do, want to, I do want to end on a positive note. We can use our knowledge about the invalidity of these biological categories in order to make things more equal and better for all. All right. Thank